Uh, my name is uh, Charles Nanga. Uh, like I said earlier, I'm an old time friend of, of Ken. And um, maybe just to talk a little informally before we go to, we'll probably have a song and then we, before we listen to, to the sermon. But I'm particularly grateful for the friendship that I shared with Ken um, for many, many years. And uh, so glad to see many of his friends remain faithful over the years. And uh, I think that's what friends are for. I'm one of the great beneficiaries, and not just myself, but my church as well, uh, in, the, in the season that Ken was appointed to be Azada. Uh, because um, w what Ken told me at the time is, he said, you know, Charlie, I've been appointed as an uh, ambassador um, to Germany. And um, because I'm also a believer, I want you to, I want to, I'll come with Judith on Sunday, and I want you to also commission me as an ambassador of Christ. I've never heard that before. Of course, I know what the Bible says about being an ambassador of Christ. Uh, but to imagine that... Uh, in the moment of glory, so to speak, after being appointed to a high position, uh, that one would be thinking about how do I also build the kingdom of God? Mm. And so I, I think Judith and, and Ken's uh, appointment uh, to, 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 to Germany was really a gift. And, and Thuita, thank you for, for that, because he told me the story and how he had his wingman back in foreign affairs and how you had fought for this. And um, I was one of the greatest beneficiaries. And, 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 you know, when we would go to Germany, there was an immediate change in terms of how our missions were run in Germany. I remember this time we were, I don't remember the town, I think Frankfurt order or some place like that. And uh, Ken said, you know, now that you're here, you know, I'll also show up. And, and when I come, you know, I will come with pomp and flurry. I mean, the typical Ken. And, and so he brought Kenyan flags. We did a Kenyan night. We did Nyamachoma. We did Mukimo, all those kinds of foods. And, and, and of course, the Germans stand up in a big way. Because they are very high on hierarchy, when they heard that the ambassador was coming, uh, you know, the local mayor was there, the entire township, the guys we'd been trying to gather, and we just couldn't get them. They all showed up on that night. In fact, one of the things that ended up happening during our German missions is that a lot of tourism then started to pick up because many people now got very curious about this country, Kenya, that is making, uh, you know, real waves. Um, and because we take a horde of young people and sometimes we'll just go to a place like, you know, in the city of Berlin, Alexanderplatz and do some concerts, random concerts with young people, dances and music and everything. I remember this time, you know, the trains had broken down. I think they had found a bomb somewhere from World War II, uh, not, not detonated. And so the trains were stopped. So within about 30, 20 minutes, there were literally thousands of people on the train stations, stranded. And Germans don't, you know, they don't take well to wastage of time. But they had this downtime. And so we happened to be traveling as well. So what happened at that time is that we decided uh, with Kolo, of course, and the whole team that we will do the Kenyan thing and spontaneous music and worship. And oh my goodness, you know, um, I don't know whether it went viral, but everybody was there with their cell phones and they were recording us. And then after some time, because it, it took uh, long before the, 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 the things, um, the trains began to move, they started putting requests, <laughs> you know, of songs, you know, can you sing this one? So I, I think um, our missions really spread. But one of the great things about Ken and Judith is that they mentored. Uh, the, 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 because we would send young couples. That, that was a young family, Kolo and Jean uh, and their children at that time. And they would get lonely. But when Ken and, and uh, Judith, uh, you know, were finally stationed there, they really had a dad and a mom. And, and they continued to mentor them to this day. You think, I, I think... Uh, Kolo was here as well. Yeah, I mean, they, they, they paid their tributes. But we had a very stable base in Berlin because we knew that Ken and Judith were there. When Maggie and I would visit after that, you know, they, they would leave, uh, the young people would leave, then we'd be left there catching up, you know. I remember one time we were catching up and just talking and um, uh, Asiko was flying by. I think they had a board meeting in Berlin. And so we started talking, I think from midnight, and Asiko's board meeting was 
at 8 a.m. He actually left the house to go to the board meeting. We didn't sleep a wink. We talked through, you know, the entire night. Those, those moments were made possible by the kind of personality that Ken was. Um, he never changed. I believe uh, even if he was in State House today, it would be the same old Ken. You know, we would be in State House. <laughs> you know, that's something that we would be missing. Um, I thank God. I think it was a God connection in terms of uh, the, 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 the role that they played there. But just the hundreds of young people that came through, went through the embassy uh, at that time when Ken and Judith were there. Um, and we felt the difference because when his tour of duty ended, things really changed. <laughs> you know, they really changed. And it was not the same place we used to go to uh, uh, before. Of course, the usual protocols were being now observed and we could feel the distance. Uh, but thank God, because of Ken, um, our missions really spread. And uh, we were able to send people not just to Berlin, but we now even have uh, other families in, in Wittenberg. And the work is, is expanding. And so personally, I feel very, very privileged uh, to have had friends like this, um, and especially Ken and the man that he was. Um, the jokes, the laughter, the joy, and just being real uh, with one another. And I think that's what most of us remember uh, here uh, from that time. So I thank God. Um, it's, of course, an honor to know that he finished well. Uh, that's really important. Um, and I think it's important for all of us to know that it doesn't matter uh, when or how you go, but if you finish well, I think that's the most important thing um, that, that we can talk. As somebody who, who knew the Lord, and so we are not wondering and speculating about where he might be, we know where he is because the, the Bible gives us that assurance that once we have connected with the Creator and we have a relationship with the person of Jesus Christ as he did, um, then the end will come one way or the other. But when it does come, then that's not the last word in terms of our life. It's not the last page or the last chapter of the book that is being written. It's just an opening into a beautiful, never-ending life with Jesus Christ. Amen? So thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm, that's what I, I could say a lot more about Ken, but I'm honored to be here and to, to see how well you guys have held together. Judith, thank you uh, for your courage and, and your faith. Um, those are not easy steps that you have taken. But to see you like this um, one year down the road, all glory and honor to God. Amen. I think, and uh, maybe mine is to thank you for being patient to listen through. I think times often are when we want to rush through life, you know, but reflection, uh, thinking through, sharing testimonies, first of all, gives us a chance to pause and see, indeed, the Lord has been with us, you know, and that's how we are still able to reconnect even with those who've, who've passed on by just reminiscing on the good times that we had together and seeing that indeed God was present. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Very for those who came and encouraged the family and just made us laugh by by just reflecting on the great memories and the great impact that that Ken had on on different individuals so God bless you so much so before we get a time to hear from the word of God I'd like to invite the the able worship team to come give us a song and then also ask us to prepare hearts so that we may get an opportunity to be encouraged by the word of God um, because I think we'll miss out on the point if we don't hear what the Lord is telling us at this point in time. The hymn tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just by listening to the different testimonies and the reflections that um, everyone who's spoken about Ken um, I think this is a befitting tribute to him. He trusted in the Lord um, and now we know where he is resting. He is resting in the Lord. So I pray that this song would encourage everyone here. <clears throat> Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise, thus to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. 
Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, all oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me will be with me to the end jesus jesus how i trust him how i've proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus all for grace to trust him more jesus jesus how i trust him how i've proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus all for grace to trust him more any of us as a poem will actually die and uh, we need to answer those questions of eternity what happens you know and and uh, to be certain about it and not to be speculative i usually say that even if we are going to start a business we are usually told to start with the end in mind so that if, if there will be an end um a preferred end then every step that you take should be towards that preferred end now the one thing that we have a guarantee of is that we will exit this world and not in our own terms god has not given us the privilege of knowing how we will exit we just know some people will fall sick others will you know all kinds of reasons uh, but at the end of the day we all get to go we exit and and i think um we can't afford to gamble with our eternity it's way too important for us to live in uncertainty as far as that is concerned when you read the bible it again and again reminds us uh, that we are here that we are temporal uh, we have but flesh you know and blood we are but dust um the words that we utter during the end you know is that the dust must return to the dust it came from and the spirit to god who gave it so we need to figure that out for each one of us so that when it's my own turn and friends stand and eulogize me then we do so with a sense of certainty that uh, we're not just talking talking nice things about this person because he was a nice guy you know where are they really and is it well or when we sing the songs that we sing it is well with my soul is it really well because it needs to be well because eternity is an awfully long time to be uncertain about we need to be sure about this the reason for our hope uh, the bible as uh, as the bible records i want to read a story it's called the road to emmaus or emmaus i don't know how they pronounce that name when i think about it i have a place down in emmali i think of emmali it's some distance away and 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 then um, certain certain events have taken place and and this is roughly the story takes place around easter the first easter ever and the first easter ever is not a glorious cheerful time it's a traumatic time for the people of israel and more so for the disciples of jesus christ because what has happened is that they have walked with this really amazingly nice guy you know uh, called jesus they call him rabbi they get call him good teacher he's been with them he's taught them he's done awfully amazing things he's healed you know brought sight to the blind healed cripples people who are born lame you know he just spoke a word and he's just this really amazing guy but the story doesn't seem to have ended well everyone knows that this is you know a good teacher he loves god he's a righteous man never sinned against anybody but his end is not just tragic it's traumatic for them just a day or two earlier they had watched him be arrested apparently looking very powerless um he's told to defend himself he doesn't respond and eventually you know under roman rule pontius pilate is the final guy to judge him 
and he gives them up to the people to do as they deem fit with him. And what do they do? They take him down uh, to Golgotha and, and, and kill him in a cruel, brutal way. He dies the death of a criminal. A guy who was really, really nice. And so with events like this, they see that savior who saved others, who prayed for others, who provided for people, who healed other people. They see him hanging, powerless, helpless on a cross. In fact, they hear him crying out to his father, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which in Hebrew means, in English, is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A helpless, righteous man hanging on a cross, uh, dying a painful, really, really sad and brutal death. Actually, it's so difficult to watch that most of them have fled. The people who are left there at the foot of the cross are really his mom. You know, mothers are cool like that, you know. It doesn't matter what happens, they stick with you to the end. And a couple of women, um, and, and they watch him die a really, really painful death. It's so painful that the, the word we use in English called excruciating is actually a derivative from X out of crucifix, out of the cross. That's what the cruci excruciating means. It's the most painful death you can think about. And the Romans were able to come up with this way of punishing people. You know, just so that there was such a powerful kingdom so that you know what it means to go against you know, the kingdom, the, 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 the Roman rule. So, Ili Ibe Funzo Koengine, they would put you on a cross and they would hang you there. Everybody would see you, you know, as you suffered and sometimes the deaths would take very long, even after three days, if you were strong. Well, Jesus had been really punished and whipped and had bled and so he wasn't strong. He couldn't even carry his own cross. Uh, he was helped by some guy called Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, because he was too weak out of the whipping and the bleeding that he couldn't survive even at the cross for very long. He died before the two guys who are the thieves that were hanged um, on either side of him. So this, this is the nature of events that had been experienced by the disciples, very traumatized, as they remember this really nice guy, and they're now questioning this whole faith that they have. And they're wondering, what's the point? We followed him. We left everything. Kenya Peter and the rest were fishermen. They abandoned their trade uh, so that they could follow Jesus Christ. But this is how the end comes to them. And they are scared. And they run away. Um, wondering, what was that all about? What were the promises that he had made? What is his kingdom he talked about? He can't even save himself. Even though he healed other people. So they are very, very discouraged at that point. Completely about to throw in the tower, give up, and we find two of them on a road to a place called Emmaus or Emmaus. It's about seven miles from Jerusalem. The spot is not known exactly where it is, but it's some unknown little dusty town somewhere. They're walking away because everything has failed, you know. The story has ended badly. This really nice guy didn't have a good ending even though he did great things and good things. And so, I want to catch that story from that point. On the road to the mouse, Luke chapter 24, uh, from verse 13. The Bible says that now that same day, two of them were going to a village called the mouse, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So this is Sunday morning. Events of the crucifixion Friday afternoon. So it's in recent memory. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. So somehow, the Jesus of the cross was very different from this Jesus who was walking with them at this moment. So they didn't recognize him for who he was. But the Bible records Jesus himself, not a substitute, and not an angel, but himself. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk 
alone. They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor in Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? The nature of the events of Good Friday are so huge, there is no other talking point. If there is something like, you know, the Herald Tribune or the Jerusalem Times, it would only be talking about that. The news would only be covering that. So what else are you talking about? What do you mean? You, are you, you must be a visitor. You know? You do not know that Brazil lost. You know? You, you must be a visitor. You know? Um, I mean, for, I, 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 for the football fans, you guys keep abreast of everything, you know, that has happened, every heartbeat. It's like, you know, a, a big, a really big thing, like an African team making it to the finals, and somebody's not aware, how, what, what do you mean? Where do you come from? You know? So the events of, 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 of Good Friday were so huge, but in this case, in a negative way, so traumatic, but everybody was talking about them, said that if somebody asks, do you know, I mean, what are you guys talking about? It's like, what else would we be talking about? And so there's a sense in which, um, things that have to do with tragedy and death is one of them especially death of a um the head of a, of a family like ken would completely capture the imagination because they are huge and the implications are humongous it's the only thing that we will be talking about um at a time like this and so the disciples stood still their faces downcast again capturing the mood of the moment because the matters that have happened are heavy and their hearts are downcast and their faces reflect that being downcast what things and i want you to think about this what is jesus really doing here it's him you know we now know he has risen because this is sunday morning but he comes and walks alongside these disciples and was almost taunting them what are you guys talking about? Of course he knows. But he wants them to talk. And then he says, oh, about the things that have happened. What things? So he's probing. Probing. And that's the thing about God. And this, in this case, the person of Jesus Christ, who is Emmanuel, God with us, or the word that became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Because he wanted to touch our lives in a very personal way. Because for a long time, the people who lived in the Old Testament days, they only knew a God of power and a God of wrath and a God of justice. You did something wrong and you're afraid you're going to be zapped. There's a guy who wants, you know, they were bringing the Ark of the Covenant and King David is out there, he's dancing, they're bringing the Ark of the Covenant and then the oxen stumble and, and one of the guys... Um, called Uza went to support the ark so that it doesn't fall and he was zapped incinerated for daring to do such a thing as touch God quote unquote that was the nature of God and David who was a man of God was afraid of this God you know we're trying to do a good thing here God you know but God is making a statement you can't support me I can support you don't you dare. And so that was the God of the Old Testament. A God of fire and smoke and wrath. People did something wrong during the Exodus. There was a rebellion. Moses said, okay guys, you know, assemble here. Let us see who God has, uh, how God is going to judge. The ground opens up and guys are swallowed and they disappear with their children and everything they own. Instant justice. That was the God of the Old Testament. But in Jesus Christ, he shows a different face. He says, I'm going to be the God who is with you. I will not come in power. I will not come to intimidate. I will not even come in glory. I will come as one of you. I will walk where you walk. I will eat your food. We will talk together. We will dance together. We will smile together. So that in future, when I tell you that I know you, that I feel you, that I can identify with your pain, then you know. You're not talking to some God who is far away. You're talking to a God who is near, who knows where you're at, who knows your struggle. And what Jesus is doing here, 
He's debriefing these people. He knows they've gone through a traumatic experience. He asks them, what are you talking about? That is counseling 101. Tell me about it. Pour your heart out. What are you talking about? Oh, you don't know the things? What things? And they will begin to pour out their hearts. Because that's one of the ways that healing happens. And I want to invite you to this kind of a God. To whom you can come with your anxiety, with your fear, with your anger. Because anger is part of the package. When you lose a loved one, you sit before God and ask him, how now? Why us? And why dad? Or why mom? You know, what are you doing? I don't understand it. And if you, you wonder whether God is big enough to take this, read the book of Job and hear some of the things that Job tells God. You know, who am I? But you've trained all your arrows against me. Can't you see I'm just but flesh and blood? You know, turn away from me. And he has this intense conversation with God. And God is big enough to take our misunderstandings, our anxieties, our anger, our disappointment with him. And that's what he wants us to talk to him about. He created us. He knows how we are formed. He knows our fears, our anxieties. And the thing is, by the time you come to tell God of these things, it's not breaking news. He already knows that's where you're at. If you're angry with him, he knows it. But he wants you to talk to him about it. Because he has answers to questions that we haven't even begun to ask. He's big like that. And awesome. And all-knowing. And all-powerful. And those are the things that we need to be engaging God in. And in this place, he, God takes the initiative. They are walking away from Jerusalem. He had told them, stay in Jerusalem until you are clothed with power from on high. But with all the disappointments around, what are we doing here? You know, you checked out on us. You promised us that you will be with us. But now you've just exited the stage like that. What's the point of staying? And they're walking away. But he takes the initiative, comes and walks with them, and begins to engage them in deep conversation. And now my iPad has checked out because it's too hot. So he feeds them. He began to give it them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. He entered into a new season. It is not the time of physical touch and embrace and so on. That time was over. He now wore a glorified body. He could appear and disappear at will. You remember in the upper room, when the people were discouraged, he would enter through locked doors, come and encourage them. They would be so scared they thought they saw a ghost. And then he says, no, 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 I'm not a ghost. Give me some fish. Let's eat. Then they realize, hiya, it's really him, you know. Then he would eat with them, and after some time, again, he would disappear. It's a glorified body. A body that does not sin, does not die, does not age. It is the age of eternity, forever and ever and ever. And that's the nature of our God. So he was introducing them to the future. This is how your future looks like, if you trust and believe in me. So here is their testimony. When he disappeared from their sight, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, the other disciples, and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And again, in the upper room, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still not believing it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. 
everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. And that's the story of Jesus. And because of these acts, we who believe in him can face death on the face and say, this is not the end. And he says, he is a pattern of us. Jesus is called the firstborn from among the dead. He's called the first fruits, meaning those who believe in him, we will be the rest of the harvest. We will be just like him. And the grave no longer has the last word in terms of the believer's life. Yes, the tent may lie there, but that's not where Ken is. Ken is in glory. In the presence of the Jesus and the God who saved him and whom he lived for and loved. And so that even as we miss him physically, as we eulogize him, the reality of it is that he cannot be in a better place than he is right now. Or more joyful or more alive than he is right now. He is in a place where there is no more death, no more pain, and no more fear. In the presence of God is fullness of joy. Amen. May the Lord bless you as you contemplate these things. And may Lord, the Lord lead you and guide you to make the right decisions for your own eternity. This is a decision that you should make, a decision, a selfish decision for yourself. So that when your time comes, then we can stand with a level of confidence and say, it is well with our soul because it is well with your soul. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much.
Family, and of course, as we do this, we know this kindles a lot of memories for our dear friend. And I think um, it's okay to embrace, um, you know, our season um, of mourning and missing and crying. It's all okay because. Uh, we know who Ken was and, and what he meant to many hearts uh, around here. And our prayer is that God will ease this pain with time. Um, we know it, it never is the same again uh, once uh, a loved one departs. Uh, but uh, we pray that uh, with the knowledge that we have um, of where Ken is right now, um, that we would look forward uh, even as we remember the good things uh, that we shared together with him. So Maggie will take us through a prayer. Thank you very much for this opportunity one more time uh, to read the Word of God together, to draw encouragement for today and for the days to come. This is a prayer of Moses, the man of God, from Psalms 90, and I will read it for us. Lord, you have been our dwelling place. This is something the family can be able to say, and they have testified. Through all generations, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the depth of death. In the, sorry, excuse me, let me read that again. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All, the, all our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moon. Our days may come to 70 or 80 if we have the strength to endure. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow. For they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing the jo for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to your children. May the favor of God, our Lord, rest upon us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. That's the leading of God's word. I want to invite us now to pray together with me. This is a prayer for this family and I was, want to encourage you to take a moment right now to just thank God for this one year without Ken in the house, in the workplaces, in our social spaces. Let's thank God for sustaining this family for touching their hearts in his own special way. Let's do that for a minute and then I'll pick it up from there. So 
So our Father, this is such a special day for this family, for friends, for relatives, for anyone who knew Ken and loved him and shared uh, friendship and shared conversations and shared uh, special moments. This is a special day. And it's special because you've been present. It's special because you never left this family on their own. It is special because even when the tears were many and they flowed freely, you are there, O oh God. It continues to be special because even when the tears began to mix with a smile, you were present. It's also special because you didn't stop there. The tears became fewer and the joy became, became even greater. The joy of the memories that were special. The times this family enjoyed Ken as a husband for Judy, as a dear father and a friend for, for, for Wageshi, uh, for Blandly, for Emmanuel, even for Steph, and even for uh, young Matthew. These became very special days, even for the brothers, like uh, the brothers of Ken, the uncles, the aunties, um, other relatives that are not mentioned here, but many that had a special bond with Ken. Friends that loved him dearly, friends that longed to fellowship together. For anybody and everybody that was special to Ken, you have made our, our solo lighter. And you brought a smile. It's not that the tears have dried completely. Sometimes it's so difficult, oh Father, sometimes. It is so difficult, it's impossible. It's like a seesaw. It's like we are oscillating from delight in one moment to deep sorrow another moment. It's challenging, oh Father. And yet many of us can testify that when we lost our loved ones, we began to see you in a fresh and new way. Even King, King Isaiah, uh, Isaiah says that he was able to see the Lord. He saw God for the first time clearly when King Uzziah died. When our tears are deeper and our mourning is deep, when, when our grief is deep, you allow us to see you. We begin to delight in you as our God, our sustainer, our provider, the one who is present, the one who never leaves. And this is our prayer for, for Judith and the whole family and the friends. That even when our, our days are dark, we see you. We see you as our God. We see you as our sustainer. We see you as a provider of grace. Grace that is new and renewed. Masses that are new and renewed. Laughter that is new and even renewed. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you for this testimony that you've been our dwelling place. May you continue to sustain this family. May you continue to bless this family. May you to continue to brighten their morning with a new dawn, a dawn that says, I am your God, I am your sustainer, I am your provider, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you, I will not sleep, I will never slumber, because I'll be present even when you don't see me. Father, according to the words of Psalms uh, chapter 3 and verse 3, Father, may you become the shelter for this family and their friends. May you become the lifter of the faces of this family. We will depend on you today. We shall depend on you for the days to come because you are God. And we say, may your name be glorified. May your name be praised. May honor and glory and praise return to you because of your goodness to this family. We praise you. We worship you and we honor you. In Jesus' most precious name, we pray and we believe. And God's people will say, Amen and Amen. Amen. I'll just read here as we repeat the tenets, the central tenets of the Christian faith that Ken believed in, which we now call the Apostles' Creed. And I'll read it out just as a reminder of the things that we have come to believe and the reason that we have hope for tomorrow. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, 
died and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. I think we are done in terms of prayer, and uh, I believe uh, you want to lay some wreaths of flowers? Okay, you can come and go ahead. The forever will be great is thy faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy time and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their crosses above, join with all nations. In manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin, and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. And for today and bright home for tomorrow. Blessings on mine with ten thousand besides. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand has provided, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. <coughs> then sings my soul, my, my soul. See the roar that walks your heart. 
ones of me. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy path throughout the universe displayed. And sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. Thank you for your willingness to participate in this beautiful ceremony. I want us to close with the words that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us into temptation but the river rise from the evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And as we continue this journey now on this side of eternity without Ken, may the Lord turn his countenance towards you, especially Judith and the children. May the Lord smile upon you. May he grant you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord, our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ and the love of God and, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Spirit be with us now, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Right. Uh, thank you so much for, first of all, uh, sacrificing your time. Uh, just to come and be with us as we mark a year since uh, Dad left. Um, I think I'll just uh, try and wrap everything up on this side so that when we move on to the next um, phase of the program, um, we can freely mingle without, uh, without there being any ceremony. So first and foremost, let me just uh, thank God for his mercies, um, for allowing us to see this day. Um, also, especially because it hasn't rained throughout the ceremony we we do thank god for that um secondly um i'd like to thank family um the immediate family mom um the girls the boys um for putting together this program um under the circumstances that we're facing it's really not an easy thing to do so um for that we do thank you um Thirdly, I'd like to appreciate the efforts that um, the team here in Akuru have also made, led by Vincent. We don't take it for granted as well that the home has continued to be a home even, even when we've not been around, uh, the home has still felt warm. Um, we thank the local administration as well, led by the chief. He sent his um, assistant, um, I think he's somewhere here, I can't, I can't quite see him, but um, the chief has also um, ensured that we have security. Um, so where you've parked your cars, rest assured that uh, there, there won't be any incidents, that I can assure you. Um, the larger family, of course, um, we do not take it for granted. They have also, um, in their ways, uh, stood with us. We don't um, take that for granted. So uh, led by um, our grandfather there, um, we thank him. Um, dads and moms, brothers and sisters, both uh, biological and the friends they made along the way who have become family. We thank you, truly, truly, for standing with us in prayer, uh, even when we've not had the strength to. Um, each and every one of you has, has said a word of prayer in your, in your places. Um, your presence as well has been um, appreciated over, over the year. Uh, that we've had 
um, be it visiting here or visiting in Nairobi, we do thank you for that. Um, I want to appreciate the team that has, there's a special tent over there, I think uh, you guys might have seen it, and if you've not, you can just quickly glance. Uh, <laughs> there are some white plates over there, so that means something is cooking, literally and otherwise. Um, we thank them for also coming through, and even for the vendors who've given us the tents, um, we don't want to um, go without mentioning them. We thank them for working through the night to ensure that we actually have um, um, the, the facilities that we're using over here. And uh, last but not least, and this is on a light note, we thank our tailors, really. Uh, you guys thought I was going to men not mention one more time. <laughs> they did a good job. We agree, we agree. Yeah. See me, you don't need my I I don't want to, I think I saved this for last because they have come through for us, not just in prayer, but even just putting together the program. The church led by Bishop Charlie. We thank you. We thank you for administering to us in prayer, in song. Even when uh, you've, you've had your, your fair share of challenges this year as well, but you still stood with us. And we thank you for that. We do not take it for granted. So thank you all once again. And uh, I think um, I will call upon a volunteer to pray for the meal that we're just about to have. Uh, Matt, do you want to come and pray for food? Nope. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, sometimes the program goes like that. Um, I will. Call, I will call upon um, our neighbor, Bona Chepkoni, to please, even as you say hi to the Wagenis, to just uh, pray for the meal that we are just about to have. I've also ambushed him. I think uh, at the end of this uh, day, I have fines to pay for just for just ambushing people, so... Um, even as he says hi to, to everybody, um, please pray for the meal that we're just about to have, if you don't mind. I pray for the meal. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Salimu Kwanza, Hamujambo. Nimechelewa kidogo. So, mutu wakichelewa nakuwa confused kidogo. Lakin in my prayer, a very simple thing to do, to pray for food. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to come before you again this afternoon and pray for the food that is before us. The food, Lord, that we ask you to bless and sanctify it. For I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.